40, like 30 verses. I apologize for that. Uh, specifically to Michelle, I guess. It's like every week everyone's like, oh, thank God. There was only one. I was like, all right, it wasn't that bad, all right? I didn't have to read six chapters of Leviticus or something, all right? It was about 20 verses. So we can just calm down a little bit. I want you to think about the last time you prayed. Maybe for you, that was just a few seconds ago. Maybe for you, that was this morning. Maybe for you, that was sometime during this work week. Maybe for you, it's been a little while. And maybe if you're honest, for you, you can't remember the last time you prayed. I want you to think about what you were praying about when you prayed. Maybe it was for a family member or a friend. Maybe it was as you were driving to work asking God to part the sea of traffic as he did the Red Sea because you were running 15 minutes late. Maybe like each of us, right, praying that the renovations in Starbucks go quickly, that we may be able to refuel fuel with our caffeine in a reasonable manner. Maybe for you, it was for patience, for that difficult coworker you work with. Lord, help me please not to fight Lisa from accounting. Maybe it was simply a question. Is there anybody even listening? Can we be honest? Prayer is very simple, but prayer is also mysterious. Prayer is simple. It's something that we can do so naturally at times, right? When something goes great, it's easy for us to say something like, thank God, right? Thank God they did not run out of coffee before I got to church this morning, right? Thank God, right? There's a parking spot. It's easy for us to do those things. When things aren't going our way, it's easy for us to cry out simple prayers like, help me. Lord, do you hear me? Etc., etc. Prayer is simple, but often mysterious. Prayer is mysterious because as easy as it is to do, sometimes it's really hard to do. And if we're honest, sometimes we feel like we don't know what to say or how to say it. Or frankly, we just can't seem to find the time to pray. No matter how much we pray, when the topic of prayer comes up, there's always this subtle reminder of something we should be doing more of, right? As I begin this dialogue in prayer, something in your mind is like, oh, I need to be praying more. Instantly come into your mind, whether you are faithful in prayer or you haven't prayed at all much lately, prayer is something each of us feel like we can grow in. Right? I have yet to meet a follower of Jesus who when I talk to them, they're like, dude, prayer, mastered it. Like, don't need any more growth. I've reached perfection when it comes to prayer. If they do say that, we got a lot more issues, right, coming along down there. Richard Foster says this, we believe prayer is something we should do, even something we want to do, but it seems like a chasm stands between us and actually praying. As a church, we've been looking at the birth of the church here in Acts 2. And we've been taking special note of the practices the early church devoted themselves to as a community of Jesus' people. And today, we're going to be talking about the practice of prayer. Why? For us to reclaim our identity as Jesus' people, we must be a people deeply immersed in the practice of prayer. For us to reclaim our identity as Jesus' people, we must be a people deeply immersed in the practice of prayer. Brothers and sisters, here's my goal this morning. First, I want to talk about prayer, what prayer is, and undo a lot of unhelpful frameworks around prayer that I believe hinder our prayer lives. Next, I want to lay before us a vision that Jesus had for his people around the practice of prayer. Then I want to establish the kind of prayer culture we want to see at Zion. And then lastly, I want to give us tools to increase prayer in our lives. You ready? Alrighty. Let's talk about what prayer is. Now, 
What I'm about to say is not incredibly profound. You're not going to leave here mind blown. But prayer is simply this, a conversation with God. Prayer is simply this, a conversation with God. Now look, I know that seems maybe too simplistic. And I realize that prayer is expansive and incredibly deep. And, and, and prayer has so many different aspects to it, right? We have adoration, confession, thanksgiving, intercession, petition, healing, contemplative, examining, examining prayer, unceasing, all and all sorts of others just to name a few. But at its core, prayer is simply a conversation with God. I want you to think about your favorite place. Everybody has one. Maybe for you it's a coffee shop. And there's just this perfect place you could sit where you don't get the heat from the sun, but you get the light from the sun. Nobody bothers you because you're kind of tucked away in that corner. It's there. That's your spot. Maybe for you it's a restaurant. They know the booth that you like to sit in. That's your spot. That's your place. Anytime you're going to meet up with a friend, you say, hey, meet me here at this place. Maybe for you, it's not in a building. It's outdoors. There's this sweet little place in your backyard you love to go. Or for you, there's this place out in the mountains you love to drive up to. Whatever it is, I want you to bring that place into your mind. Your favorite place. And then I want to ask you to imagine Jesus in that place with you. It's just you and him. He's across, he's across from you with a cup of coffee. He's walking alongside you, along the riverways, wherever it is that he's with you. What do you tell him? What do you say? What do you ask him? What do you think he might say to you? Brothers and sisters, that is prayer. In your mind's eye, you're sitting there. What would you, what would you ask him as he sat across the table from you? What's heaven like, right? What happens when we die, right? Was the moon landing real? Whatever it is that you would ask Jesus, right? Whatever it is you ask Jesus, what, what would those things be? What would you talk to him about, right? And I want you to think, okay, after the shock and awe is over that it's Jesus, right? What kind of conversations would you have? What things would you share with him? You know, after this one experience, if every single day you met him in that place, what would be the things that you talk about? Maybe tell him about your day. Maybe tell him what's going on in your family. Maybe share with him some struggle you're having. That idea in your mind is what I want you to think of when it comes to prayer. It's just simply a conversation with Jesus in your favorite place. Just talking to him about life, about family, about the things that are important to you, about art, about music, about movies. Whatever it is that is in your heart, that would be what you would talk to him about. Richard Foster, who I will quote often in this sermon because he is a gangster around prayer, he says this, We do not need to be shy. He, being Jesus, invites us into the living room of his heart where he can put an, he can, we can put on old slippers and share freely. He invites us into the kitchen of his friendship, where chatter and batter mix in good fun. He invites us into the dining room of his strength, where we can feast to our heart's delight. He invites us into the study of his wisdom, where we can learn and grow and stretch and ask all the questions we want. He invites us into the workshop of his creativity, where we can be co-laborers with him, working together to determine the outcome of events. He invites us into the bedroom of his rest where, where new peace is found and where we can be vulnerable and free. It is also the place of deepest intimacy where we, are know, where we know and are known to the fullest. The key to this home, the heart of God, is prayer. And I love that imagery of just being at home with God in his heart. And the way we have access to that home is to the key of prayer. We can talk, we can laugh, we can cry, we can ask, we can worry, we can shout, we can whisper, we can just be still. All of these are forms of prayer. Now when it comes to prayer, there are a couple of barriers that I want to address 
that I think kind of get in the way of the prayer life that God has for you. The first is this. Prayer is about intimacy, not performance. Prayer is about intimacy, not performance. Jesus says this in Matthew 6. And when you pray, so Jesus is assuming we are praying, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. Can we be honest? Christians get kind of weird about prayer. Have you ever been in one of those settings? The settings where it seems that they're trying to perform for the other people in the room. You're there, you're praying. It's just a simple prayer before a meal, but somehow it has become a 45-minute lecture about the atonement theology, right? They're just spewing out kind of everything that they could ever know, right? I've been in so many settings where it seems that the people who are praying are performing for the people in the room and not talking to their heavenly Father, And like the Pharisees, praying becomes about being seen by others and not meeting with God. People are acutely aware that they're being heard as they're praying, so they're trying to use language that would uh, make them seem spiritual. When you talk to them, they speak like a normal person, but when they pray, Oh, Heavenly Father, Thou wast the Most High above all the earth. And they start quoting scriptures that don't make sense, but they just, they know it. And your word says, Lord, that all things work together for good who those who love you. And your word also says that I could do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So, God, will you strengthen this meal to help us digest these potatoes? It's like, where are we going, bro? Like, we're just talking, we're about to eat dinner. This is steak and potatoes. Where are we going? But they start kind of doing this thing. And a lot of times in church environments, specifically church meetings, that kind of happens. And there's almost this competition of who can quote the most verses. And it just gets weird. And it's like, what is even happening here? Or we're supposed to be praying. And it's become this performative thing. At family events, Thanksgiving, Christmas, they come together for the special meal. And it's an hour and a half prayer. And it's like, the turkey's cold, man. Like... That ship has sailed, right? I'm salivating over my yams, like just trying to eat, dude, and you're taking forever. We do this thing where we think prayer is about performance, but brothers and sisters, it's about intimacy. Hear me in this. You perform in relationships when you're insecure. Think about a couple who's dating each other. First start to date each other. They are both on their A game, right? They never smell bad. They never look bad, right? They always kind of have it together. Oh, I just woke up. I'm sorry. She's been up for three hours putting on her makeup, straightening her hair, right? Guys have the decency to spray and deodorant and stuff like that, clean the trash out of their car if they're going on a date, you know? They try to glam themselves up a little bit, you know? They kind of perform for the other person. They laugh at all the jokes and, oh, me, no, I'm not tired. I don't mind staying up to 3 a.m. talking to you on the phone, right? It's about performance, It's about showing you like, hey, baby, I'm the guy, and hey, baby, I'm the girl, right? It's showing each other its performance. But then what happens after time? And there's intimacy built, right? Out come the messy buns, the sweatpants, right? The eating McDonald's while driving, the I'm sorry, I just got out of the gym, I reek, whatever it is, right? But that's where the good stuff really starts. So you get to see each other for who you really are. When both people first come together, they're both insecure. They don't know where the relationship's going. They don't know what it's going to look like. But when there's security in the relationship and intimacy, then realness comes out. They no longer have to perform. The goal is not just to impress the other person. It's to be with the other person. And this is the image I want us to have in our mind when it comes to prayer. Brothers and sisters, here is this. God is never impressed by a prayer. God is never like, wow, (laughs) you want to talk about theologically sound, right there, guys. You hear that, angels, right? No, he's never impressed by a prayer. He's never like, can you believe that? 65 minutes of prayer, right? He just wants to be with you. That's what matters most to him. He just wants to spend time with you. He just wants to hear your heart. It's about being just intimate with the Lord. Many people perform in their praying because they're insecure with God or insecure with the other people in the room. When intimacy is the priority, 
Prayer becomes about talking to your father, not impressing other people in the room. One of my favorite things about God lately, and I say that because he's always showing me cool new stuff, is this idea that God speaks your language. And not just if you speak a different language, if your first language is Spanish or something else. He speaks that too. But God speaks your day-to-day language, your slang, the way that you talk. And I love that about him. And one of my favorite things is praying with people who are like you're just coming to know the Lord because they're just like real with God. They're like, God, bro, you always got my back, Lord. And I'm like, yes, because he speaks your language. You know? And it's not irreverent because you're a son and a daughter. And you're just talking to your dad. And that's one of my favorite things. God, I'm all stressed out, man. Work is crazy. You know, I've even been people, as they cuss when they pray as they're coming to the door. And people would be, oh my gosh, but that's their father. He's speaking their language. And to be honest, to be candid, he hears the stuff you say the rest of the time too. Not just when you're praying. And so he speaks your language. And when you come to him, oh, holiest father, thou in the high, he's like, who's this? I don't know who this is. God speaks your language. However it is you come to him. For my scatterbrained folks, he speaks that too. The all over the place popcorn, he speaks that too. He speaks your language when you're frustrated, when you're sad, when you're mad, when you have three words to say or you have 30,000 words to say. He speaks your language. So hear me this. You don't have to try and speak his. You can come to God with the words you know, with the way you know how. And here's the wonderful thing. He meets you where you are. If I were just to ask one of you guys to stand up and pray right now, anxiety would sweep over you, right? Because it's a reality of performance. We're in a church setting. That dude's the pastor. There's like a lot of like really spiritual people here in this room. But when you understand, when you're asked to pray, you're not asked to perform for the people in the room. You're asked just to talk to your father. And this must be the posture. And this, this is a great hurdle for people. But when you have that picture in your mind of you just sitting and talking with Jesus and speaking your language, and not worried about other people in the room, that's the prayer God wants to hear the most. And so if this is a barrier for you, you feel like sometimes you have to perform when it comes to pray, the Lord wants to tear that down and says, I just want to be with you. I don't care about fancy words or poems or sonnets. I just want to hear your heart. So for us, let us just pray simply. No need to overcomplicate over-indoctrinate, right? Just pray simply. God, help. Lord, I'm tired. Lord, will you help them? God, help me see in the language that we know how. The next hurdle that I want us to talk about is this. Prayer is about honesty, not pretense. Jesus says this, and when you pray, do not keep babbling like the pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. For some reason, when it comes to prayer, we put all of this pressure on ourselves to pray with faith we pretend to have, not the faith we actually do have. To pray with faith that we pretend to have, not the faith that we actually do have. You notice this when you give all sorts of caveats and nuances and explanations before the prayer right? You're praying for someone to be healed. And God, we know that when you heal, you choose when you want to heal. And you're always good. You're Jehovah Jireh. You always provide. You always show up. And Lord, we know that all things work together for good. So no matter what, all these caveats, instead of just saying, God, will you please heal my friend? Right? We have to provide all these explanations, all these back doors out of the prayer just in case it doesn't work out, right? And, and, and oftentimes we try to, to, to use all sorts of language to make us seem like we have greater faith than we do. And we aren't honest with the one who we're speaking to. And I love that idea. The Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Now for you that might beg the question, then why ask Him? Because He's your Father, Because he wants to spend time with you. Because for him, it's not about efficiency. 
right? If there would be a much more efficient way to meet with God other than prayer. I'm sure our type 1s could th- figure that out, right? Our type A people could figure that out. Prayer is the long, slow way. But that's the way he loves the most because he gets to spend the most time with you. And so prayer is about honesty. Now, what I don't want to do is like make it seem like praying God's word is a bad thing. Look, if all you know how to do is pray God's word, that's a beautiful and powerful thing. But what we're trying to get to the heart is this. Prayer must be honest. You know what honest prayers are? God, where are you? I feel like you're nowhere to be found. God, I'm scared. I have no idea what to do. Father, please help me. My heart is broken. C.S. Lewis says this. We must lay before him what is in us. Not what ought to be in us. And there are so many examples of this all throughout the scriptures. Don't believe me? Just start with the Psalms. I want to point out three real honest prayers. First is Elijah's. So Elijah is contending with the prophets of Baal. And it's that famous moment where he calls fire down from heaven and consumes the altar. That's this dude's Wednesday, okay? Calling fire down. He gets word that Jezebel wants him killed, and this sends him into a frenzy, into a panic. He flees, and he runs away, and he's terrified. And God meets with him. And look at Elijah's prayer. He says this, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites, your people, have rejected your covenant. Torn down your altars and put your prophets to death with a sword. And guess what? I'm the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me. This is how Elijah is talking to the Lord. Uh, By the way, your people are terrible. They've gone against everything that you've said. They've killed everybody who spoke on your behalf, i.e. my friends. And now they want to kill me. Thank you very much for the assignment. I'm good. Right? That's how he's talking to God. He's honest. He bears his heart before him. This is a terrible situation. I didn't sign up to get slashed, right? I signed up to come and to share your word and look where I am, out in the desert, starving, hungry, tired, and running for my life. Thank you, Jesus, right? For this. He's being honest. The next prayer is David's prayer I want to point out. He says this, How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts day after day and have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. David's saying, if you don't answer me, I'm going to die. Right? A little dramatic. We could be a li- but we've all been there. Right? We've all been in that season of life. No one's, oh God, thank you for these trials and tribulations because we know that they're good. Where are you? Are you sleeping? Did you forget about me? Where are you at right now? And even in the life of Jesus, as Jesus has been crucified and is dying, he prays, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's as honest as it gets. There's this culture, and I don't know where it came from, but it's here, and it's just pretending in prayer. There's been a couple of times we've prayed with people, and you walk out of the room, and you'd be like, who are they praying to? What were they even praying about? Because it was all pretense. It was all pretending. What God wants is honest prayer. He wants you just to tell him how you feel. God's not shocked. <gasps> that came out of your mouth, right? He, sees it, he hears it in your mind, right? He knows how you actually feel already. But as a good dad, he just wants to hear from you. And he wants to hear the honest truth. He can handle it. He's God. He's pretty capable. And there's something very healing in just being honest with God. There's been so many times in prayer for me where I kind of feel something bubbling up. It isn't until I tell God about it. Like, that situation really stunk. Thanks, you know? 
And then I start working things out with God. And then I end the prayer by being like, yeah, you're right. You're pretty awesome, right? But it's like I kind of come in a little hot. Like, hey, time out. What's going on here? And by the time I leave, God's already done something in me to kind of just allow me to that space just to complain or to cry or whatever. I even think about Moses, right? And one scene, Moses is like, kill me. You're giving me all these people. They're the worst. No thanks. And the next moment, he's like, God, you're so good. We thank you so much for this. It's like, it's both and all throughout the scriptures. But what's always present is this heart posture of honesty. Brothers and sisters, hear me in this. God wants to hear you. So be real with him. The next hurdle I want to talk about is that prayer is about consistency, not hype. Prayer is about consistency, not hype. Jesus says this, but when you go to pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. In charismatic movements particularly, um, there's this like quest for hype, where I want to feel something. And there's a lot of people who feel that way, that in their interactions with the Lord, if they don't feel something, that it's not genuine. And so prayer kind of becomes about hype, right? It becomes about having to feel. So I got to pray something until I feel something. Let me tell you something really candid. The most seasoned veterans of prayer will tell you prayer is radically ordinary. The people who intercede at 4 a.m. aren't levitating when you walk in the room and a beam of light shines down on them and is behind them. You know what it looks like? Crusty eyes, a cup of coffee, and just praying to God. No hype. It's not beautiful. It's not crazy. There's not Bethel worship in the back, right? They're just praying. It's radically ordinary. But those are the best kinds of prayer people because they consistently show up. A praying life isn't built from transcendent moment to transcendent moment. It's built by a long obedience in the same direction. Prayer is not about emotional moments. Now listen, they can happen, but prayer is about showing up, spending time in the presence of God. It's about moving towards God one step at a time. Prayer, most often, won't feel like much. And if you're honest, sometimes when you pray, you can feel a little crazy. Has it happened to you while you're praying? You're like, wait a minute. Am I just in a room talking to the ceiling right now, right? And thoughts like that begin to kind of come into your mind. Why? Because the work, the practice of prayer is radically ordinary. And that's how it's supposed to be. Notice the way that Jesus describes prayer here. Going into your room, going into the, going behind you, closing the door, and being with the Father alone in the secret place. Unseen. There's no hype. It's not crazy. There's not Pentecostal fire dropping down. It's just regular life. Praying and meeting with the Father. And so for you, if you're struggling with prayer because you feel like you didn't feel anything, that's not kind of how it works. It works by you just showing up. And as time goes on, your relationship builds more and more and more with the Father. The next thing is this. Prayer is a conversation, not a monologue. Jesus says this in John 10. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. This is one of the larger misconceptions we have about prayer is we kind of treat, treat it like a drive through line with God. Right, you wait your turn. There's people all over the world. Okay, you get up. Hi, Lord. Uh, I'd like to have peace for my anxiety, a little help with my finances, and some patience with my kids. Thank you. That'll be 595. Cool. Thank you. You just kind of go around. Thank you for the prayer, Lord. Have a good day. Ugh, they left out the whipped cream. Whatever it is, right? That's how we treat prayer with God. It's kind of like a drive through thing. Prayer is a conversation with God, which means you talk and what? He speaks. My sheep know my voice. A huge part of prayer, hear me in this, is listening, it's being still, it's quieting the mind. And look, God wants to hear everything in your heart. The good, the bad, the ugly, the stressed out, the worried, the anxious, all of it. But he also wants you to listen. He also wants you to hear from him. Have you had a friend who treats every conversation you have like a monologue? They're always in crisis. 
There's always stuff going on. You know when you see them on the caller ID, all right, babe, this is going to be about an hour and a half, right? And you get on there, and I just don't know why. And they just keep going on and on and on. And they don't want to hear what you have to say, right? This is not a conversation. This is a vent session, but it's always that, right? It's fine when it's on occasion, but when it's all the time, what happens to you? It's exhausting. You're like, am I just an emotional punching bag? Like, what's, what's happening here? What's, in this, what's the context of this friendship? And you know them, but do they even know you? No. What kind of intimacy there? Is there any sort of intimacy there? No, you're more functioning as like a free therapist than a friend. The nature of prayer is that it's relational. It's conversational. It's back and forth. It's give, it's take. It's having conversations with Jesus. And so it doesn't just look like, here's a rapid fire of all the stuff I need. Thank you. Have a good day. It's conversating with your father. It's sitting at the table with Jesus, talking to him about stuff, asking him for stuff, and then giving the space to listen, to hear, to be silent before him. God always chooses intimacy over efficiency. He wants to talk to you back and forth. When you make prayer only about you talking, guess what happens? You'll get bored of hearing your own voice. Maybe you're really struggling with prayer because you're bored of your own voice at this point. You haven't provided any space for God to speak back. Now, I kind of want to lay before us this vision that Jesus has for his community to be a people of prayer. Luke 19 says this, when Jesus entered the temple courts, he began to drive out those who were selling. It is written, he said to them, my house will be a house of prayer, but you have turned it into a den of robbers. This is a famous scene in Jesus' life. Right, he shows up at the temple with a homemade whip and he starts turning over tables, right? So imagine a setting like this, we're all here for church, and then someone comes in with a whip and just starts slinging it and throwing things and be like, you have made my my father's house a house of thieves, right? Imagine the kind of uh, turmoil that would cause, chaos that would cause. And the scripture authors go off to say after this that that they were reminded of the verse that says, zeal for your house will eat me up. It's this idea that Jesus is so passionate about God's house that he is furious when it becomes something that it's not meant to be. And Jesus' critique is of the new system that's been established. And it's about coercion. It's about oppression. It's about marginalizing the poor. It's become about all these other things and has left its core thing, which was to be what? A house of prayer. It has become a marketplace to rob and to steal from God's people. You can see why Jesus is frustrated. Now there's all sorts of conversation that needs to be had about the oppression of the poor and how they were doing things to oppress them and to steal from them, etc., etc. But the thing I want to focus on for us right now is that Jesus' vision for God's house was that his house would be a place of prayer. Often, churches think that prayer is something we do, but according to Jesus, it's fundamental to who we are. Prayer is something we kind of tack on to things to kind of give it the extra blessing, you know, as we're doing things. But for Jesus, it is fundamental to who we are. To be Jesus' people means we are people of prayer. For Jesus, the church should be a place marked by the practice of prayer. But often, we see that prayer is an accessory to the church, not at its its gravitational core. So for us last year uh, in 2020, God really met us pretty profoundly as we did a prayer series. So one of the things we initiated as we gathered in this building was a pre-gathering prayer service. So before the service, there's a service where we come and we seek the face of God and we pray. But candidly, we have a long way to grow in terms of our prayer culture here at our church that we want to see birthed out of this house. If I could be perfectly honest with you, as an individual, there are some areas we, as an individual church, there are some areas that we do really well in. Uh, for those of you who are involved in like our Slack chat and stuff like that, it's like there's some really good things happening there in terms of praying for people's needs and stuff, so that's good. But I feel, to be honest with you, there's a great chasm in our church when it comes to the prayer life of our church. 
I feel like in a lot of ways it is an accessory for us. In a lot of my pastoral conversations, prayer is not something we center our lives around. It's something we do when we feel we have time. Or to be more honest, we do when everything starts to go wrong. I believe this is a place we must grow. And we must commit to growing in the place of prayer. We see in the life of Jesus a life modeled around prayer. Luke 5 says this, Yet the news spread about him all the more, so that crowds and people came to him to be healed of their sickness. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. A lot of times we want church to be efficient. To come in, to get the church stuff done, to do the work of the ministry, to do that kind of stuff. And that matters. Jesus had thousands of people waiting to be healed. What was the priority for Jesus? To go and to pray. There will always be a need. There will always be this time to go. But it was absolutely essential, pivotal for Jesus to withdraw and to be with the Father. Candidly speaking, I feel like often we get busy going through the motions of church, of life, of work, or whatever. And prayer gets the back burner. Rather than prayer being at the forefront And then we schedule those things after the fact. As Jesus is about to be crucified, in just a few hours before his death, how does Jesus choose to spend his time? Praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. And what is his instruction to his disciples? Hey, I need you to be praying. Yeah, Lord, we'll be praying. Right, and they pass out, and he comes back with you. Hey, wake up! I need you guys to be praying. Oh, yes, Lord, and we just pray in Jesus' name. I'm so sorry. You know, whatever. Busted. They were sleeping again. And so he's pleading with them to please, please, please pray as I go. And even while Jesus is being crucified, he's praying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. All throughout the life of Jesus, prayer is at its core. Now, Jesus is fully God and fully man. How much more for us just regular people should prayer be at the core? So I want to talk about Zion becoming a people of prayer. Brothers and sisters, for us to walk in the destiny that God has for us, And for our city, we must become a praying church. But here's something we must understand and we must know in the core of our being. Prayer changes things. It really does. It's not a therapeutic thing for us to do just to help give us a sense of inner peace about the things happening in our world. Prayer changes things. They have done studies on the human brain while people are praying, and there are some pretty traumatic things taking place in the human brain physiologically as we pray. Scientists are baffled by it. Don't believe it? Go look the research up for yourself. They're like, well, I don't know. When people pray, it's, 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 profound things take place. I can tell you that in the life of the church, which hasn't been super long, If it were not for prayer, we would not be here. If it were not for prayer, I would not be here. Our leadership team would not be here. The only way we're getting to where we're going is by really embedding ourselves in the practice of prayer and really believing that it changes things. Now, I know when it comes to prayer, if we're a little honest, we're a little afraid. Because maybe for you there's been a time where you've prayed and you felt like God didn't answer. You asked the Lord to heal them and they weren't healed. You asked God to do something and you felt that he didn't show up. And I understand that. I understand that fear. 
Now, I did a whole hour talk on unanswered prayer. So unless you want this bad boy to go three hours, right, I'm going to encourage you to go listen to that on our website. But it comes down to three basic ideas. Uh, God's will, God's world, and God's war. Three kind of main ideas around why prayers don't get answered. Uh, we'll take the world first. Sometimes we ask God to do things that are against the way he structured the universe. For example, let's say you're about to fall, and you're like, God, please help me. What you're asking God to do is suspend the gravitational pull of the earth for a momentary time for you not to fall, right? If we weigh the balance of the earth going off, losing its gravitational pull versus you falling and getting a scratch, you know, it's like, come on, right? So there's God's world thing, the way that things are structured. There's God's will. So each of us have a will and enact that will into being. There's things that we want, there's things that we do, and those all affect things. Now multiply your will by 7 billion people. There are a lot of wills at play. Now multiply that by spiritual beings, spiritual ent entities, the demonic, the Satan, etc., their wills, and God's will, and all these wills are constantly in the flurry of things. And in that we pray, right? So it's, it's complicated. There's a lot to be conversation had there. Again, did an hour talk on this last year. Go listen to it. The last thing is God's war, that there's active opposition against the very things God wants to do, right? There's that famous passage in Daniel where Daniel's praying and interceding and finally the angel shows up and is like, hey dude, sorry, we were like duking it out, you know, with, with these demons on my way here. The prince of Persia, I was wrestling with him for a week, but no big deal, I'm here. Sorry about that, sorry I was late, right? Just like no big deal for Daniel, okay? There's, there's so many things at play here, but what I want to encourage you to do is, is surrender that fear the word, the word says that perfect love casts out fear and to engage in prayer anyways. Because there are so many things that God wants to unlock for you in the place of prayer that will only be unlocked in the place of prayer. There's no other place for it. There are things that will not happen unless we pray. And there's so much biblical precedent for that. James says... You have not because you ask not. What he's saying is not it'll happen no matter what because God is in control. What he's saying is you don't have it because you haven't asked him for it. Meaning what unlocks what God is wanting to do is his people praying. The, the, the scriptures also say that God searches the whole earth to and fro, looking for those whose hearts are loyal towards him, that he may show himself strong on their behalf. Meaning what? God is actively looking for people who are actively looking for him so that he might move. That when God's people come to pray, God sees that and responds to faith and showing up in power. Now there's a lot of complexity there. I know, I get that. But we have to believe that prayer changes things. Karl Barth says this, To clasp the hands in prayer is the beginning of an uprising against the disorder of the world. And I love that idea. That what's happening, what's being birthed among the Jesus people is a revolution against the ways of evil and wickedness in the world, the ways of darkness. And the way that we push back against the darkness is by praying. It's by as a people coming together, interceding for our families, for our friends, for our city, and crying out to God. And he responds to those cries of faith with power. But it's this clasping of the hands. Richard Foster says this, individuals are living lives of quiet desperation without purpose or future and we can make a difference if we post on Facebook. No, and we can make a difference if we write a really strongly worded letter and we can make a difference if we just send them a text and letting them know. We will make a difference if we passively, aggressively post on our Instagram story a verse that will kind of coincide with what they We will make a difference when we pray on their behalf. We must become a church who stands in the gap for our city. We must become a church who intercedes for God to move. There has never been a great move of God without first there being the beginning place of prayer. Never in history. 
you can trace back every single monumental shift in the movement of the Jesus people from the beginning of its inception in the church and where it always begins is in the place of prayer. Now, let's get practical. You're about to leave here and try to figure out how to do this thing in your life. How do you become somebody who prays more? The first thing I want to encourage you with is, again, keep it simple. Don't overcomplicate it. You don't have to have it all figured out. You don't have to have all the right words to say. Just say what you know. If all you can spare right now is 30 seconds in your day, that's the best you can do, then do it. Then 30 seconds, the best you got, go. Keep it simple. The next thing is to keep it real. Be honest. Don't pull any punches. Don't shy back. Be honest about what's going on. Be honest about how you're feeling. Be honest what's happening in your world. Be honest what you're worried about. And the next thing is to keep it up. Don't stop. Keep going. You get one day, awesome. Do the next, and then the next, and the next. Keep it going. If you miss a day, it's not the end of the world. Pick up, start up, do it again today. Keep it up. Keep going. Let's keep prayer being a consistent thing. The next thing I want to ask you to do is to schedule it in. And I might seem like, oh, that's such legalistic. Like, I just, you know, I want to be led by the Spirit as I pray. Look, scheduling in time with God, is a, it should be a priority for you. I know it sounds kind of like type A. Some of these, like, my very artistic people in the room are like, calendar or whatever, you know. But hear me out in this. If you don't make time for it, you will lose that time. You know as well as I do, there are all sorts of things always vying for our attention, always grabbing and pulling our attention. So schedule it in. You have reminders on your phone. You can utilize those. So when you get space brain and you forget, what you, you can have your phone tell you, here's what you're supposed to do, right? Beautiful technology. Utilize it. Schedule it in. Order your rhythms around prayer. Instead of it being coffee, coffee, coffee throughout your day, right? Why don't you do prayer, then coffee, prayer, then coffee, prayer, then coffee, around your day? Instead of having whoever your employer is dictate the rhythms of your day, let your prayer dictate the rhythm of your day, and then you go around your work schedule after that. Does that make sense? That, that the centrality of your life would be built around prayer, not other things, and then prayer, if I can, at the end. The next thing I want to encourage you to do is something called listening prayer. And I invite the worship team up as we kind of close now. And so, I feel like you have enough tools to get started into how to talk to God, but I kind of want to have a conversation around how we listen to Him. Because that sounds very spiritual, right? It's like, I'm listening to God, leave me alone. It's like, Charlie, right? All right, oh, cool. But I want to give some framework around this. So this isn't something new. It's not like new age or something like that. This has been embedded in the story of God from the very beginning. We even see throughout the scriptures, all these references to people kind of pausing and doing listening prayer. David calls it meditating. It's all of these places in the scriptures. It's this idea of you just kind of being quiet before the Lord and asking him to speak. Jesus is clear. His sheep know his voice. And that begs the thing that, that means God is then speaking for you to know his voice. And there's things God wants to share with you. All throughout the scriptures, there's this urge for us to eagerly desire the spiritual gifts, e eagerly desire to hear from God. Specifically, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14 uh, that we would operate in the prophetic, which is where you hear from God and you share with somebody else. And so what I want to instruct us in is basically listening prayer. And so when you've come and you've talked to God and you've shared with him and you've poured out the things you want to say, I want you to carve out a moment of your time where you just sit and you listen. Now don't put all kinds of pressure on yourself. If you feel like you don't hear anything, then get up and start your day. No big deal. But I want you to kind of calm your mind, calm your heart. Don't be thinking about groceries and all this other stuff as you're praying. Just calm everything down and ask him to speak. 
And I believe that he will. And I know that he does. And whatever he tells you, do it. Listen. Now I know there's already skeptics in the room. But what if and how come and what do we do? All those things, sure. If what you hear in your mind is something contrary to God's word, that's obviously not him speaking, right? He's not going to contradict himself. That should go without saying. If he's telling you to do something that's contrary to the nature or character of Jesus, that's, not, that's obviously not his heart. But I'd rather train us in discernment to know how to fix things when things go wrong than us not ever take steps of faith to really hear from him in the first place. I feel like we put all these caveats around listening prayer because we're afraid of weird things happening. Dude, weird things happen whether we're ready for it or not, right? But I'd rather us take risks and steps of faith for us to hear from him and do corrective work later than never step out in faith and hear from him. And I believe God has something for you this week. Something he wants to impart onto you, something he wants to share with you. So I'm going to ask you to stand. And we're going to pray. I'll lead us in prayer. And then we're going to do a few moments, a few seconds of listening prayer. We're going to do this right here, right now. We're going to do the stuff. Well, you just quiet your mind and your heart. The worship team will play. And you just ask God, speak to me. And just to align our posture with what we're trying to do, I'm going to ask you just to put your hands out just like this. Nothing crazy. And this is just a sign of saying, God, we want to receive from you. It's this posture of, oh, Lord, we just want to receive the gift that you have for us here this morning. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for the gift of prayer. God, thank you that we could just come to you with however we are, whatever's going on, whatever's in our mind.